Hey, hey, welcome to our session today. This is Politics and Design, How the Biden-Harris Creative Team Won the Election. Thank you so much for having us today, South by Southwest. We're glad that you all are joining our session and wanna hear about everything that happened during our um, crazy past uh, 18 months during the campaign and uh, what we've been doing since. We're excited to catch up with you all. Um, my name is Karana Magwood. I'm gonna get us started today. Um, I'm gonna talk to you all about what it was like to work remotely on the campaign, what it was like to um, elect Joe Biden and elect Kamala Harris uh, as our president and our vice president of the United States. Um, what that whole journey and process looked like for us um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we're gonna be joined by um, Robin Kanner, who was our senior creative advisor on the campaign and Jonathan Hoffler, who actually designed the typefaces that we used during the campaign and who uh, advised us all throughout on uh, our typography system and uh, the final font that we used on our final Biden-Harris logo. So let's dive in. Again, I'm Karana Magwood. I was the deputy design director on the presidential campaign for Joe Biden and uh, then Kamala Harris. And I am now the creative director at the White House. That's what I'm up to these days. Um, but now I wanna talk to you all about the meat and the juice and the excitingness of what we did on the campaign. First of all, we're in the middle of a pandemic still. Um, and that is something that's very important in the job that I am doing now. Um, but what that meant during the campaign was we were operating in a virtual and a uh, new space for a presidential campaign. It was a crazy time, a trying time, an exciting and exhausting time. And one of the things that we focused on on our team and what I focused on with my team was really finding the balance um, and what that looked like for us um, or for me, the effort, I don't know about the execution, um, was getting in the gym. Um, and that kind of means something a little different than what you probably are thinking, although um, I probably did need to get in the gym a bit more. Um, but we are gonna talk about getting in the gym and it's time to get in the gym. These are some perspectives from myself, um, a black creator, a black woman and a black leader of an incredible design team uh, that grew from two to 24 people uh, over the course of several months. So let's get started. Uh, first things first, what is one of the first things you're going to do when you're preparing to go to the gym? You're gonna get dressed. So what I like to think about, how I really worked with the team was talking about getting things together, first things first, putting things in order. Um, and that's very hard when you're working in a fast pace and uh, ever-changing environment like a presidential campaign, but it's important not to skip these steps because they really are gonna make or break the quality of what we execute. So when we get dressed for the gym, we're talking about wisdom, we're talking about information, we're talking about resource, we're talking about doing the work before you actually create anything new. Really looking at what came before, what vision you have, um, really making that mood board. Um, so you'll see here that this is what that looked like for us on the campaign. And that included designs from all over. Um, some of this is our work. Some of this is the work of others that we were inspired by. We take no credit um, for this. And I certainly take no credit for the amazing work that my team did. Um, but you'll see some of the things that really pulled together. We were making brand languages for Joe Biden. We made brand languages for our Vote Joe page. We made brand languages for our opposition um, and really trying to uh, disarm and take down and beat Donald Trump. And we made brand languages for um, really getting to connect with and getting to know the people and the people getting to know our candidate, um, Joe Biden and then Kamala Harris. So take a look. Um, this is how we got dressed. We mood boarded. I pulled these right out of our Figma, which we are huge fans of on this campaign. And um, those are a couple of things that we use to mood board. All right, I'm going to keep moving. Uh, next, check in. When you get to the gym, you got to check in. This really translated for me as showing up. It was so important 
when we are actually doing this work to show up every single day. And that was hard. Um, we went through a lot of different things on the campaign. Um, we went through so many different experiences from everything that was happening in our country last summer um, with Black Lives Matter and the slaying of so many precious Black lives. We were going through so much as a country dealing with uh, what we saw in our news cycle every single day with Donald Trump. We were dealing with so much with the deaths of people that we um, know and love in this country and the change that was happening and what we really expected and wanted out of our leadership. So it was so important for us every day to check in at the gym to just show up. Um, and you'll see that looks like something totally different when we started the campaign. Um, I started the campaign in July of 2019. And uh, my first hire was Abby Pitzer, who I actually um, joined me at the White House. And that's her over there holding up that Joe Biden sign. Showing up every day meant something very different before the pandemic. Um, and it meant coming into that office, bringing new ideas, working for an entire organization with just two designers um, and getting things done. Um, you'll see our little design wall. We really tried to find ways to celebrate and, and to get excited about what we were doing, even when it was hard, even when it was tough. And it certainly was uh, tough and hard uh, more often than you think when you are two designers servicing a whole campaign. So very excited that we got to do that work. And um, then you'll see showing up meant something very different once we um, encountered the coronavirus pandemic. Showing up meant coming on to Zoom every single day. Uh, our team did check-ins every single morning. We got together, we told jokes, we uh, you know, talked about what we did the night before, what we did on the weekend. We talked about things that were happening in our lives. And many of the people on this call have never met in person, have never seen each other in person. I actually just met um, one of my colleagues for the first time just last weekend and He's six two, and I'm five two, and I we really you know we talk about these kind of things on the campaign. We get to know each other, but it really just I'd never seen him in person, and it just blew my mind. So when I tell you that these people have never met before, I mean it. Hired, working together, um, really a family, knowing you know all the intimate things of the ins and out of our lives. We spend so much time on these calls every day, all twenty four of us. Um, and that meant knowing each other's pets and knowing each other's family members. And, you know, Abby's mom would pop in and say, hey, dinner's ready. And we'd be like, hey, Abby's mom, welcome to the call. Hey, thank you for letting her, you know, giving, giving all this time and all this work. Um, but a huge shout out to our amazing team and the hard work and the dedication that they gave because um, there were certainly times where it was difficult and it was hard work and uh, we, you know, there were moments where you wanted to tap in and tap out. And, and in so many ways, because of the way we built our team, folks could, you could take the break, you could take a moment, um, but that was because your other teammates would show up for you. They would hop on the late night call. We would be on Zoom, you know, six or five of us at, in a group working on a project till two in the morning because, you know, things were coming in last minute and things were changing and edits were being made and approvals were being had. And so, um, we were able to show up for one another and therefore we were able to show up for the country. And that was probably one of the biggest things and one of the requirements that I had when I was doing the hiring um, for the team. And when I would consult with uh, my leaders and, and Robin and really thinking about what was important uh, attitude. I, I remember so many people that I interviewed and talked with, you know, I look at their portfolio. I knew who I wanted to hire based on the work they could do and if they fit into what we needed for the team, but it was the attitude and the drive and, and the excitement and the push for the work that we were going to do because, you know, if you got this project and it's hard and it's terrible and there are late nights and there are no weekends and there are, there's barely time off, um, you need people who are driven and who are excited. And so um, showing up was a huge criteria and something that we had to do every single day. Um, but even beyond showing up, um, one thing that we had to get past, especially me, uh, a black woman, a black creator, was making sure, uh-oh, making sure that my badge worked. So did my badge work. When I showed up at the front desk of the gym and I tapped in and they said, hey, Miss Magwood, welcome, um, did my badge work. And that meant for me that I had to be validated, that I had to um, be assured that I belonged. Um, and what that looked like was a real internal 
um, strength building and an internal uh, work to know that I belonged exactly where I was and the work that I was doing was valid. Um, and I, I recognize this uh, in so many of my colleagues and other black women, when we have a seat at the table, when we're standing in the room, when we're doing the work, having that inner um, strength and courage to know, to trust that our badge works, that we're here for a reason, that we belong, um, and just knowing that this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We are brought here for a reason. Um, I wanna showcase some of those amazing black women that I worked with. Um, there were calls and times where we'd get together, where we'd encourage one another, where we'd strengthen one another, and where there, where we could share those moments where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling beat down, I'm feeling beat up, I'm feeling like, you know, lost in this moment. It's hard for me to witness what's going on in the world and, and still lead my team and still do these things. Um, or, you know, I'm working with people who don't look like me and who don't recognize in so many ways. Um, the value and and the respect that I that I bring and that I deserve. And so how do I make sure that I show up for myself, that I tap my badge in and that's the qualification that I needed to be here and that I show up for myself so I can show up for my team. Um, so showing up was two parts. It was coming every day. It was being dedicated and committed to the work, the hard work. Um, but it was also that inner confidence and in getting in front of the room and, and getting in, in the, the boardroom and sitting at the table and saying, hey, these are my ideas, these are my thoughts that I belong. And I think um, so many of us can attest to what it feels like to have that challenged, whether that's an external challenge or even an internal challenge about what we believe about ourselves. Um, I, I had moments where I sit at the table who actively, uh, I would sit at the table with people who would actively question um, my role and my place to push higher and to expect more and to do more. And even in that, still having to know that when I walked out of that room, what I had to bring to the table, what I said, what I thought, what I believed um, that we should be working towards and strategizing for was valid and, and worth it. And even outside of just what I was expected, that I was allowed and able to bring more. Um, and I think that that's, that's one of those things where we have to show up for ourselves. We have to be able to bring more. And so as we're talking about being in the gym and we're talking about preparing to go to the gym and showing up at the gym, we really are setting a standard for ourselves on how we're going to get this workout in. Um, but before we get to the workout, um, we can't skip the important step of the warm up. And for us on the campaign and on our team, that was uh, an incredible and exciting moment and, and something that we felt and, you know, uh, believed was sort of uh, new and exciting. And, and we led the way on our team in this way um, before we would go into debates, before we would go into nights where we would do rapid response um, for events that the uh, then VP Joe Biden was doing um, or the, the, the then Senator Kamala Harris was doing, we do mock debates. We do mock trials, basically. Uh, mock debates where we get the team together and we pick you know, a debate from uh, 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 Mike Pence's vice, president, vice presidential debate, uh, his gubernatorial uh, debate, we pick a Hillary and Trump debate, and we'd run through that debate and we'd get, get you know, our team set up and everyone assigned to a role and a place, the different designers from our social designers to our merch designers to uh, our event designers, and we'd have everyone in their roles, who's cutting photos, who's grabbing rapid response, who's editing, who's reviewing, who's approving, who's sending to approvals. And we'd run through these mock debates and I'll take you through um, a couple of screenshots from our Figma here, where you can see we were really just preparing. We were warming up so that every single time we had game time, we were ready. Um, and I know this probably does not sound unfamiliar to you, but in a presidential campaign, when things are moving fast, when um, everything is coming at you and your team and you're servicing not only your headquarters, but your, your states and your coalitions and the different groups of people um, who need design and creative. This was huge for us to take two, three hours out of our evenings before we're gonna take that same two or three hours on an actual debate night and say, all right, team, uh, 
call time is this time be on the zoom call at 7 p.m we're going to get started at eight everyone be prepped and ready to go um and and really setting ourselves up for success here so we ran through those we made sure we were warmed up and that meant flawless execution uh, or near flawless execution when we got to debate nights and that meant we were able to get things out of the door quickly i think um if you all remember when we did the fly swatter and, and the uh, rapid moments that some of the t-shirts and the buttons that we put out during those events, that, that happened in the moment, but it was able to happen because we were working as such a well-oiled machine by the time we got to our workout because we had warmed up properly. Um, and that's something that I, I recommend for teams to do, to learn to do when you're preparing for game time, do mock uh events that that's not just for um certain industries that's certainly for our industry as well especially when um rapid response and, and moving things on the fly is something that you're gonna have to do and do often um it was a great time uh lots of fun and i i can tell you that uh working on some of the older debates and having to like find cutouts and pictures and um do quotes of mike pence or hillary clinton it, it was insane. It was crazy to to be like we're arguing things and moments that happened in history um, and, and that happened in the past. Uh, but it it made it so that when Joe Biden got on stage with Donald Trump, when Kamala Harris got on stage with Mike Pence, we were ready. We were game time ready. Um, and so because of that, we're gonna go right into our workout. Um, it was time to get our workout in. So uh, for this, I really want. Um, people to take the liberty to understand that as you are training these muscles, as you're getting um, these systems and these processes in place, now you get to do the, the fun and an invigorating part that everyone looks forward to, which is making those creative decisions. And one of the things that I like to tell people um, and that I actually learned in this process was how important it was to build this gut muscle. So not just to go to the gym once, not just to go to the gym once a week, but to go to the gym the recommended three to four times a week or three to five times a week to go daily if possible. And what that means in design and creative for us was we were making creative decisions based on style, based on research, based on feeling, based on audience, based on history, impact, trend, whatever we wanted. We were making art and trusting ourselves and trusting you know, that we knew and we had um, a process in place and, and that we were creatives and that we were um courageous and that we were willing to go outside the box based on anything that we wanted to bring to the table and i think being in a presidential campaign made that very conducive because you have so many fast moving pieces um the brand doesn't live forever but things are going out into the world um and they have a moment to live and then a lot of times they die and you really want things that um, you know, if you base it off of impact, you might want your piece to have impact. You might want it to feel like historical to the campaign. You might want to feel like the style um, matters and, and le leans into um, what you're doing for the overall brand um, that you're working with. But more and more what we did from the time we started this campaign to the time that we finished was build that gut muscle, that gut muscle to create, that gut muscle to trust ourselves. So I'll take you guys through some of the things that we did and talk a little bit about um, those parts that we focused on of this gut strengthening workout. Um, so we worked in hand, hand lettering and hand drawn um, typography. And that's outside of that beautiful typography that we use in the campaign, the mercury and the gradient. Ooh, the mercury and the gradient, mercury and decimal um, that we use. And I still, we still use these to this day. So I don't know how that slipped my mind, but handwritten um, type typography became um, a big part of what we did. Being able to go and um, make things for, for when we were in a pandemic, we created a free store and we had downloadables online that people could do phone backgrounds and Zoom backgrounds and computer backgrounds and really adapting and throwing things at the wall and seeing what stuck and trusting once something stuck that we could keep throwing that up for, for a little bit and hoping that our audience would be receptive to it. And they were. Um, we were working on 
um, metallics and getting fun. And I think, you know, a lot of people heard about our Vote Joe language and our Vote Joe brand while we were um, working. And that was something that was very new to this environment, very new to a presidential campaign. And again, that trusting our gut, putting it out there. And trust me when I tell you, it wasn't um, just smooth sailing. Here you go, design team. You all can just do this. It was certainly something that um, we had to say, jump with us because we're jumping, jump with us into this moment because we believe this is going to work and we've seen our work and our decisions and our gut work before. So jump with us, take that risk again. Um, you'll see things like we did a whistle stop tour um, towards the end of the campaign for Build Back Better. We created some amazing posters um, that this creative was led by myself, Eric Zeminski, and um, Chelsea, whose last name I cannot remember right now. Oh my God, Chelsea, please forgive me. Um, but Chelsea, uh, who of Squiggle Studio, and um, she is, you know, a phenomenal illustrator. Uh, we worked, this is one of those projects where we were up late nights, uh, 10 p.m. one night, 2 a.m. the next night, from noon to you know, 9 p.m. the next day, still working on this, um, and and it was rapid. So it was it was like one of those things where you drop everything and you do it. And we were making a train and a bus and a plane and another bus um, and trucks to go across Pennsylvania. And so it was one of those things where when we did it, it hadn't been done for us before, and it hadn't been done on our presidential campaign. And we we made the decisions. We brought in some of our key elements. We brought in those gradients. We brought in those bright colors. We stepped outside of some some boxes and, and took the creative liberties to do things that no one said we could do, but that we trusted ourselves this could work. And it was a huge success. Um, we got so many requests to sell this poster. I don't think that we actually ever did, but I was able to pick up some um, on from the train stop and just seeing it in person and seeing um, these things come to print, which was another like hurdle to master in a pandemic is not ever being able to see your work in print or in real life and possibly until after the event happens. If someone magically brought it back in a suitcase for you or, and could drop it at your house, shout out to Olivia, um, who was our traveling digital director and would do that for me um, and drop things by my house at the front door. Um, while we were trying to stay in quarantine. So again, trusting that gut and just knowing, building all that knowledge that we've brought and learned from our past experiences to where we are now. Um, really tapping into who our candidate was. Joe Biden was a candidate who for empathy and, and being empathetic over apathy. And we were fighting that, that narrative of what Joe Biden would bring to the table and what America was experiencing with Donald Trump. And we really tapped into that. And we really wanted to show that this is someone you can trust who cares? Um, and again, taking those creative liberties. This was the Vote Joe brand. It was bright. We stretched our type. Um, we used these these rich gradients, and, and we really tried to give um, the person who we were representing to the world, just as we knew him. Um, and so that was a real, real beautiful thing. Uh, we went out and did merch. We explored, you know, even outside of our typefaces. Again, that handwritten type and. Uh, I worked uh, with Dama Damaris Bravo on this um, and this Latinos for Biden. And again, trusting our gut. We went through so many iterations and, and we would always go through so many iterations of things just to get to the thing that we said, let's try this. And again, a lot of it, we didn't know. We didn't know it was gonna work. We didn't know, we just trusted ourselves. We trusted our gut because we kept working it out and we kept doing. Um, so exercising those muscles, the more you do it, the stronger you get. Um, again, that beautiful hand lettering. And one thing we were able to do with Decimal and Mercury was also build in that hand lettering and that style that we love um, into our design. You'll see some, some of our early uh, logos from Brother 1867 here. And uh, don't kill me, Robin, <laughs> for having this on here, but it is one of our older designs. Um, you, we also wanted to try new things. Uh, we worked really closely with our coalitions group and one of those being AAPIs. We did comic book styles. We really wanted to tap into the AAPIs, a symbol as you know, people who are trying to work hard and, and do good on behalf of their communities. And this was a huge success. This um, language, this, this sub-brand for AAPIs actually stuck for the entire duration of the campaign and was really well regarded within that community. So we were so excited. Um, that we were able, again, to 
work the process of trusting ourselves, of doing the research and we'd mood board these things and we do the research and we go through all these processes of gut checking with each other and strengthening each other's core until we got to the solutions that work. We relied heavily on our foundations. You know, Joe Biden was always saying truth over lies, unity over division, hope over fear, science over fiction. So we tapped into that foundation and we made buttons and we made shirts and we made sure that we continue to push the message of the campaign to the point that our audience could receive those messages in more ways than his speech or the clip that would show on uh, the late night news, those types of things. So really taking that gut role and saying, all right, this, this that we're doing is very important. It is very impactful. And not only that, we're gonna keep doing it and doing it well. So that again, not only are we strengthening our gut, but we're strengthening the gut of our our organization to trust what it is that we do. Um, and it, it made approvals and made our jobs a lot easier as we went. Um, Souls to the Polls was one of our, um, our initiatives that we did towards the end of the campaign um, and, and really stepping again outside of that color palette and really trying to bring hope and, and bring, um, this was an element of faith to the picture of our brand and to the picture of uh, who we are and who the, who the audience is that we represented. Um, another one of those moments, trust in our gut. This was a huge success, um, doing our hand sanitizer and doing this, this style and bringing in the gradient. And trust me, um, this was one of those projects that I absolutely loved, loved doing. Um, I remember like dropping a couple of things saying like, look, I'm on the hand sanitizer today. I've got to get this layout down. And you know, you get it in and you send it to the print, um, to the manufacturers. And they're like, listen, your font's too small. And I'm like, hey, okay, this is gonna work, it has to work, like let's get magnifiers and attach them on there. Like that wasn't a go. Um, we ended up of course just finding new ways to increase the size and, and paring down the language so that it still made sense and it had our COVID-19 policy on there, um, but that it would fit our needs. And this was a huge success. We really, we sold out of this so quickly and we had a ton of quantity of it. So it was really one of those things where once we started hitting wins, we were like, oh yeah, let's do it. Let's keep pushing. Let's take it to the next level. Let's take it higher. What can we do next? Um, and then again, really just leaning into what, what we started to see was working um, and, and knowing that, okay, in my gut, this is going to work. Okay, next thing. Okay, great. This is going to work. We had some wonderful illustrations that were done um, by Abby Pitzer and some work with um, Pablo on these. They were fantastic. They became a staple of our brand and our language and ways that we could represent Americans um, in our um, in our campaign. Now, next, after you get your workout, I, I want you to consider that doing this workout um, and doing the same one every single week and every single time and every single day isn't the answer. It doesn't work. Um, what we had to also learn and know, and this was one of those big challenges for me because I'd always be ready to fight for my ideas to the death. Like you guys just don't get it. You don't understand the creative process that we're going through, why this makes sense. Of course they don't, but I had to learn. Uh, don't marry it. I, I kind of showed you the sneak preview. I'm clicking too fast over here. Don't marry it. Don't marry the idea. Be ready to defend your decisions. Be ready to stand up for what you know in your gut is the right thing, what it is that you want to do as a creative, but don't marry it so much that you're sacrificing the relationships that you need, the build and the trust that you've built um, to get to something that ultimately your client doesn't want. And for us, clients were the various departments and the different people and the different teams. So, you know, we had seven pairs of amazing socks here that we wanted to put out. Joe Biden had great socks. And it was one of those things that we noticed, like he'd kick his leg up on stage. You see the, the dog socks. And we were like, yes, we need socks. We need Joe Biden socks, um, ice cream socks. And and aviator socks and logo socks. And I'm like, give them all, put them all on the store. People will buy them, dress socks, crew socks. Yeah, okay, well, first of all, they're like, Karana, we're not gonna put seven pairs of socks on the store. So we need to narrow this down. I'm like, no, 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 these are great. They're so good. Like, don't marry it. Um, we ended up going with two pairs of socks. Of course, like I wanted the ice cream. Uh, we went with the aviators, which I still loved, uh, and and with the crew socks. And again, these were some of our top sellers. These did wonderful. Um, and one other example I'll show you of that, we had these beautiful, like exciting and colorful um, little tumblers that, that we wanted to do. And 
don't marry it. Okay, all, all these options, we went with one. One option went up. Um, so don't get glued to it, don't, don't marry it. Um, be ready to switch up the workout, be ready to be flexible, be ready to change things up to get to the end goal and work with the teams that you have. That's one of the things that our team learned um, and, and that I learned. And not only did I learn it, because of course I knew it, but I really had to put it into practice. And that's something very different from knowing something is actually being able to do it. I think we all know that. Um, and then a couple of things you want to be careful about. Of course, there are some dangers. There are some, some um, blockers and things that you want to be careful when you're at the gym. You don't want to go in blind. You don't want to stay blind when you're in the gym doing a bunch of workouts that aren't getting you the results you need. Um, so a couple of things that I'd tell you to think about and be concerned about um, as it pertains to being a creative in this space um, and what we did and how we learned on the campaign. Be wary. Be wary of people who don't challenge your thinking. You have to challenge your thinking. One of the things that I learned, um, even in trusting my gut, even in building this, this gut muscle, um, was I had to challenge my thinking. I had to always be ready to bring in the ideas and the thoughts of my team. I, I brought in amazing people and I've always said, I never want to be the best person in the room, the smartest person, the most knowledgeable person, the most creative person. I hired people that I believe are better than me. They're better than me at this, they're better than me at that. I wanted to be around creatives who were the best, who would challenge my thinking, who would bring something new to the table that I did not know. Even as their leader, my team taught me new things every single day. They still teach me things to this day. I'm, I'm on, at the White House, uh, with Abby and um, also Tegan Aguirre, who actually was a fellow with us at the beginning of the campaign before we hired her full time. And they're still like, they'll, they're coming out of nowhere. Tegan comes and she's like, yeah, if you press this button on Figma, it'll get rid of your side panels. And I'm like, Tegan, we went 18 months and nobody knew this. And they're still teaching us things to this day. Um, and that's a little thing, but I really mean it when it comes to creative. You wanna be wary of the type of leaders and the type of people that you are working with and work for and the jobs you're in, who don't challenge your thinking, who approve everything that you send, who think everything you do is great because what you really want is a leader who will stretch you. Um, and I kind of put this in here just as an excuse to talk about some of the cool things we did on Vote Joe, which was stretching type and, and alter, altering what was the norm and doing something out of the box, really reaching um, a different audience than what was our main Joe Biden page and really taking an opportunity to say, this group of people who are more inclined to be on social media, be on Instagram, you matter. We wanna talk to you. We wanna reach you. We wanna engage with you. We want you to be engaged voters. Um, and so in that same way, you want a leader who is going to be engaged with you, who's going to care about what it is that you're doing in your career, where you want to go, what you want to do. They should stretch you. They should understand your goals um, and, and they should help you work towards them. They should give you projects that, that challenge you to do something outside of what you think you're qualified for or what you think you can do. Um, and that's something that I, I practiced as a leader with my team and that my team also helped to teach me because there were certainly things about leading a team of 23 amazing designers that I had to put myself out there and, and do some stretching, okay? Stretch out. Um, and not only that, as a leader, as someone who um, started um, on this design team as the first hire, the first designer, um, even having to stretch myself in ways that I hadn't stretched yet before, which was like, you own everything and you have to do all this work to all of a sudden you're giving away all these parts that used to be your job and learning to delegate and learning to like, oh, I can be a little hands off on that. Oh, we hired a project manager. Thank you so much, Asia, New Asia Newsy. You can have this and, and being able to stretch myself. So again, that stretching process goes both ways, but it's so important that your leadership does that. Um, and next, uh, you want that same um, caution and wariness of a leader to have the skills to be able to protect you. Um, one of the things on our team that we practice and that I practice and that Robin practiced was protecting our team. We are a team and we are doing the work for literally hundreds of people, hundreds of projects a week. And there's so much moving around. Stand up for your team be there for your team, acknowledge their needs, understand that leadership is service. You are there to serve your team. You are there to serve your leadership. 
Um, so I, I would always like, you know, what does my boss need? What are you working towards? How do how does what I'm working towards help meet the goal that you have set for our team and for our department and for this campaign? And how do I make sure that my team has what they need in order to accomplish those things? And how do I have what I need to be able to accomplish those things. So protect our team, shout out our team, thank our team um, on this. Uh, this is just a couple of folks, but Jess, Jessica Monroy, um, Ryan, who is a twin. So I'm also gonna shout out Kyle because I don't wanna get you guys mixed up. I love you guys so much. Um, OJ and Dama and Julian and um, Chelsea and Eric and so much of what you all do um, is a part of being able to form this culture of family and togetherness. And so it's so important to make sure you have that. Um, and then of course um, you want to make sure that you take the risk and not just once. So you've done the workout, you've been in the gym, take the risk, don't just do it once, okay? Don't take the risk once and say, whoo, made it, didn't die, I'm good keep taking it. Um, one of the things I'm showing here is actually um, from our current, my current job, which is as the creative director at the White House and the work that we're doing there. Um, right now we're focused on this American rescue plan and making sure that we get Americans the help they need after this uh, coronavirus or during this coronavirus pandemic and this economic um, downturn that we are hoping and looking to turn around for our country. But there's a lot of things that need to change. So, and this, you know, you come into this big job, and again, we'll go back to the imposter syndrome. You're looking around this beautiful White House campus, and you're like, how the heck did I get here? You know, somehow somebody let you in the door and said, great, you're here to lead, you're here to do the work. Um, and so walking into that is obviously a very um, big and prestigious thing, um, and something that I take very seriously, and I'm very honored to do. And at the same time, the real work people are looking and watching and saying all right what are you going to do and you know i remember telling my boss when uh he called me to tell me that he wanted me to take this job and saying that you know i want to shake things up i don't want to do typical presidential we didn't do that on a campaign i want to do something different i want to step outside the box i want to take the risk and so i'm saying that here for the accountability but i'm also reminding myself you know of those things that i did um, say that when I came in, I want to serve the people, I want to take the risk. And um, one of our first brands that we built out for this American Rescue Plan included some illustrations. Now, I'll tell you, I'll tell you guys, honestly, I don't consider myself an illustrator. I don't consider myself someone who um, can draw real good and, and sketch it out. Like, you know, I'll do a little scribble scribble to make sure my team understands what I'm talking about if I'm trying to, you know, provide them with creative direction. But this is not a skill that I advertise on my resume and put on my portfolio. But I'm telling you, I stayed up one night and we were heading in the direction on this brand to begin with. I, 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 it didn't sit right in my gut. Now I've built this gut muscle up in the past two years and um, at this job and then and, and the, the five years at the, my previous job, I built up this gut muscle and I got to exercise it. So I stayed up all night. I'm talking, you know, nine o'clock. I'm like, yep, got to do it right now. We're getting to it and um, stayed up, did these illustrations on my iPad overnight. And like when I'm telling y'all, I surprised myself. All right. This is crazy. But I put it up. I show my team in the morning and they're like, this is great. I'm like, wait, what? They're like, this is great. I'm like, okay. We refine it. Of course, Abby, who is our resident illustrator, she's truly amazing at this work. Um, she goes in, she's like, okay, let's refine it. Let's clean up this, let's clean up that. Let's change this, let's change that. And, you know, I'm like, you know, especially when I do things um, or when I lead something, I don't care what, what level I reach or what role I'm in. I'm always going to ask and check with my team and make sure that there's another set of creative eyes that look at something, because again, I hire people that I believe are better than me. I want to make sure that you, what you see and what I see is our very best. So it doesn't matter whether I do it or someone else does it, we're always gonna work in that way. And so even then um, we did this, it's been very well received. It's been well received by our um, by constituents and our audience and uh, our internal leadership, which is always a huge plus being able to get that buy-in. Um, but we didn't just do it once and we're not gonna just do it once. We're gonna do it over and over and over again. Um, and here we are, um, you'll see some of the work that we've been doing for uh, Black History Month. And 
the designs and the styles that we decided to go with. And again, this is not something you see at the White House, but guess what? You got a black creator leading the team. You've got someone who wants to take risk, who has a gut muscle that she trusts, that she's gonna use and a team that has the same. And so we're gonna keep on doing um, this work in the way that we have. Um, and we believe it. We believe that we have this gut muscle to do this. Um, and then next you'll see, uh, you'll see one of the important things um, that I talk about, which is that um, some of you watch this and you're already here and you're like, oh, I've heard this all before. This is not new to me. It's good to be reminded, but I'm not talking to those who have already heard it before. I'm talking to the creatives who still feel like they have room to grow, whether you are 15, 18, 25, 45, 65. I'm talking to the creatives who believe that they are lifelong learners, who believe that this work that they're doing and the job and the, and the gut building and the workout in the gym never stops. I mean, I see um, older people walking and, and running and I'm like, I don't know what it's gonna take, but I wanna be 75 and still being able to go out and get the jog in. And I mean that in my work as well. I want to be able to grow old and still feel like I have a lot to learn. There's so much creative knowledge out in the world. I believe that it is our job as creatives. I believe it's our job as um, leaders in, in design and as uh, emerging leaders to expand our thinking, to think outside of the box. And oh no, my slide went away. I'm going to put it back up. All right, uh, girl, listen, the technology, you will not ruin the end of my presentation. Um, it's our job to really think outside of the box, to get out of our own heads, to be okay with sucking at something, even when you're considered an expert at so many things, doing something new, trying something that's never been done before, taking the risk, trusting your gut and building that gut muscle up in so many different areas. There is so much knowledge and so much skill in this world there's no way that we can obtain it all. So, you know, every single day there are new methods and new processes being added to the creative sphere that are honoring what has been done in the old um, and what has been done in the past. And so if we can tap into that, if we can build our gut muscle, if we can get our workouts in, if we can make sure that we're warming up how we're supposed to, we're doing the research, we're getting the right clothes and the right shoes and, and, and thinking about what has been and where we wanna go, I, I believe that we're going to really make the impact that we want to in the world. And potentially, you know, if you listen to this advice, you could elect a president and a vice president of the United States of America. Our team did it. We use this methodology um, and, and we use this process. We worked together. We stayed together. We showed up. We had the confidence. And, and when it was hard, we didn't quit. We just kept trusting our gut and building that muscle up. And so I thank you all for joining me today. I hope that you take away from this that you're capable, that you're able, and that you just gotta continue to build that up. Trust yourself, trust yourself, you can do it. I appreciate you guys, I thank you. And I'm gonna get ready to turn it over to Robin, who uh, is you know, my right hand, phenomenal creative, and Jonathan Hostler. Thank you so much um, for having me today. I will give it to you guys to go ahead and get started. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Robin. Uh, I was the uh, senior creative advisor for the Biden-Harris campaign um, and uh, the inauguration as well. Uh, and this is Jonathan. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Heffler. I'm a typeface designer and typographer, and I had the uh, privilege of working with Robin on the entire Biden joint, which I'm uh, pretty excited to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. So I started in, um, I started in March on the campaign, um, March of 2020. Um, it's funny, in, in January of 2020 is when uh, Rob Flaherty uh, and I started talking about the Biden campaign. Um, I was living in DC at the time, and I remember taking an Amtrak to Philadelphia and going to HQ at a point in which the Biden campaign wasn't exactly flourishing. And um, it, was, uh, it was a totally different environment. I mean, it's like very quiet and folks are still trying to figure out, you know, how they were gonna um, make this thing work. Um, and uh, by the time I officially joined in, in March, it was, um, it was the real deal. And um, there was a lot of work to get done. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, I, I felt that, um, you know, Corona did such an incredible job in, in inheriting a, a brand and, and making it um, um, uh, what it was, but there was sort of another level that I felt like you could reach. And um, a lot of the work that uh, we was about how to get that to another level. Um, so um, yeah, you know, when you sort of have to take on a mammoth, like the campaign, um, it can be very overwhelming really quickly. Um, um, so if that's like, you know, the website or all the advanced stuff or social or ads or merch, um, it becomes a lot really quickly. And um, what I needed to, do, needed to do was just take things one by one um, and sort of simplify the process as much as possible. Um, and the first thing we really cleaned up was the typography. Um, and I remember sending Jonathan a DM on Twitter. Uh, I'd gotten your number from um, Mike Essel and uh, I, I was just kind of like, hi, I'm Robin, you don't really know me, but can you please talk me out of using Gotham? Cause I'm really considering it and I need guardrails. And, and then we hopped on the call and, and really we're off to the races. Yeah, I remember the conversation. I mean, since, so it, my studio designed Gotham in 2000 and it became the Obama typeface in 2008 and then was reused in re-election in 2012. And it's become a political staple ever since then. And I think because, um, you know, Saul Sanders work for the Obama campaign in 2008 and um, uh, all the typography that sort of began with the logo into the, the typeface and its use has really made Gotham a staple of political typography. So. You know, the nice thing is it's a good shorthand. The mm -hmm. other thing though is it's a bit of a cliche. So we were talking about is not just what it means for a candidate to use this typeface, but for Barack Obama's vice president to use this typeface and how we can do something else instead that differentiates from 2008 because it's an entirely different time in history of the different candidate. Yeah, yeah, the different candidate was like the biggest thing I think because um, I know, you know, folks would hear Gotham right now and be like, are you kidding me? Like they even considered that and, in hindsight, I mean, it really was a logical move. Like there was, there was many logical moves for, for choosing Gotham if we actually went in that way. Um, it wasn't the 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 right move, um, but it had logic to it. Like it wasn't the craziest yeah. idea in the world. So, um, you know, making the decision to go with decimal was sort of like a, a much more broader, large conversation about how to how to really um, um, make Joe visually his own person. And yeah. Um, you know, that's a decision that isn't a light one. Like you really gotta know what you're doing <laughs> at that point in history. You can't, it's not like a, uh, um, it's not a haphazard decision. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. I remember when we were working on this initially, you did some explorations of just Biden's name in Gotham. And I was surprised that even changing the weight and the letter spacing and the color made a big difference. It didn't feel like 2008, you know, hope and change anymore. It really yeah. felt like this is Biden's voice. Yeah. Um, but when we switched to decimal, which is, so Gotham is inspired by architectural lettering and mm -hmm. it has a kind of ubiquity and a kind of, you know, non-negotiable quality about it. Decimal is based on lettering on wristwatches. And there was a style that watches used to have and stopped having in the 1980s when digital typography became a thing um, that was very distinctive, also very plain spoken, but from a different tradition. And my, the way I would describe this is since lettering on watches is so small, there's not a lot of room for flourish. There's not a lot of room to give something personality. You're you're catching a lettering artist at their most unguarded, making mm -hmm. something, saying something that's just very direct. I need to letter this half a millimeter high in a watch. Yeah. And when you and I began talking, it was in May, just after George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this. I remember going to the Biden site to get a sense of like what the visuals of the campaign were. And there was his statement, which was enough. It's time for us to take a hard look at some uncomfortable truths. Yeah. And I just remember thinking that so much of the, the rhetoric had been, you know, thoughts and prayers and all that nonsense. Here's a man saying, I don't know what to say. I don't have all the answers, but I'm moved by this and I'm outraged by this. Mm -hmm. And I am I'm of this country. We need to deal with this. Right. That really kind of spoke to the kind of sincerity that you were bringing out of the typography at the time. And I think that's how the typeface came to be a good fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, yeah, that day was, um, I remember being, having those conversations and, and sort of knowing what was coming. Um, I had um, earlier in the cycle been with Beto O'Rourke down in El Paso um, during um, that, the mass shooting at Encila um, uh, Vista, that, that Walmart. And um, 
it's uh, I, I there are certain waves of the country and, and you can start to feel them push and um, around that time I definitely felt the, the push coming in um, when I knew that we were going to say something um, uh, I wanted to make sure our typography really conveyed like a, a strong truth of, of what that meant. Um, we had a serif that we had been using, um, but to me it just felt too delicate and um, you know, I was I was worried about rollout of the new brand. I felt like, you know, once we rolled that one piece, like everything was going to come. And um, I remember um, I remember emailing you and saying that we had um, this piece coming out, and I wanted to use Mercury for it because it just felt like the right move. And um, very quickly responded, and I was just like, "Yeah, of course, go for it." And yeah. um, you know, we switched out the site and did that. Um, but the, you know, there's certain patterns of the country, and um, I think that um, you can really feel that wave when you're in the middle of the campaign. Um, I felt it when I was in El Paso, and similarly with, with George Floyd, I, I felt it in. in um in dc and, and everywhere um so yeah it felt like the, the right move for the typography and um it ended up being the the correct moment to sort of roll things out too yeah. yeah so i think one thing that's worth talking about i mean most graphic designers who work on brands and we're talking here about a uh, you know blank canvas that you're giving a personality to uh are working with a bunch of intangible ideas this needs to be quirky or elegant or whatever um you were working for a campaign with an actual person who had an actual voice already. And one of the things we, met, we talked about earlier that I thought was fantastic was the idea that we're not just capturing the voice of this person in terms of the spirit of what they're trying to say or the qualities of what they're trying to say, but the actual words, the actual cadences of how Joe Biden expresses himself. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's been so difficult in politics in the last 20 years has been trying to distill things down to a logo or a message or a kind of one word, you know, a 10 word answer Sure. Here we have somebody who's been in public service for five decades and speaks in nuanced and sophisticated sentences that come from the heart. So I remember asking you earlier, is there a slogan? What's the, what's the, what's the motto going to be? And there never was one. There were bits yeah. and pieces of things, but there were statements. There were, you know, sure. we must build a stronger and more expansive middle class. There's, we yeah. must protect and build an Obamacare. Yeah. What I mean, I remember the conversation about how we can actually deal with the the size of these things in typography, and you had the idea of the serif and the sands. That's that's worth talking about, I think. Yeah, it, I mean, that comes from having a, a musical background, and, and this is something that you and I have talked about a lot. But um, you know, I grew up in playing music, and you know, a big part of playing music was, was finding rhythm to things and, and finding the sound of things. And um, you know, the the first sort of pieces of research I did on the campaign was just watching a bunch of speeches that Joe had given. And, you know, one thing became very clear, which is that, you know, if you go back in history, Hillary Clinton is really good at two, three word hits, like I'm with her, stronger together. Those are all words that, you know, um, are supposed to be loud and, and verbose. And if you look at Obama's campaign, yes, we can, like those are three words that are loud and verbose. Um, Joe Biden has a little bit more flourish, right? We're in a battle for the soul of the nation. Um, uh that's a that's a it's it's a great line to hit but there's a lot of words and um battle soul nation are really the only ones that you you want people to remember we're in the of the like those are those are just words that connect the sentences and right um and if you go back and, and watch his speeches from from uh, you know a decade or two decades ago he's always spoken this way this is just his pattern of voice yeah so um the big thing was 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 finding two typefaces that could connect and, and um create rhythm to his cadence and um that way uh basically you know it didn't matter what he said on a stage like we knew visually that we could go out and take that quote sort of reframe it a pinch and and post it on instagram and, and really give people um the same takeaway that he intended when he said it um, so you're sort of matching the the, the style of, of how he's saying things with the, the visual that, that people are seeing. Um, and yeah, that came out of music, it came out of understanding chords, it came out of understanding, um, you know, how songs are written. And, you know, what was helpful is when we had the, the full team together, you know, we were able to share this language. So, you know, if Joe would give a, a talk about, you know, um, clean water, for example, um, and we would, would get a line that, that sort of talked about clean water, or a line about healthcare, or a line about um, how Donald Trump was failing the American people. Um, 
we were able to take that and say, okay, here's the here are the three most important words of the sentence. That that's our major chord. That's our decimal. And then here are these other words, and, and these are sort of our, our smaller, lighter chords. Um, and uh, it was really able. It was really easy for us as a team to be able to do that quickly once we understood the language together. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a fun little trick that I didn't know was gonna work. Um, some things, things sometimes things work in your mind, but they don't work in other people's mind. Right. So a lot of what I did was trying to communicate. This is how it works. Does it make sense to you? And um, without sounding like pretentious or like a douche, <laughs> like I wanted to be able to be like, does this actually make sense to you? And uh, if it does, then great. Now we have language and we can we can talk about things. But um, it's not always easy to to find that language that people can share. Yeah. So this is an interesting thing as well, which is that. So I guess it was by about June we'd established this idea. You'd come to it musically, and I'd come to it kind of syntactically. I was thinking about yeah. things like, you know life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, where the words are life, liberty, and the mm -hmm. pursuit of happiness, dividing things into these main words and these secondary words. So you have the same idea, but written in musical language. Mm -hmm. We very quickly developed this little template of how we can use decimal for the big things and different kinds of mercury for the small things, you know, yeah. italic lowercase, Roman small caps, and so on. Um, I think what's been interesting with this campaign, um, and I'd worked in the Warren campaign earlier in the year, and certainly on Obama in 2012 and 20, 2008, What's different about this one to me has been that everything grew up from the foundation of typography as mm -hmm. opposed to down from the logo. Sure. And that's kind of a good segue to talk about the work we did on the logo because it's very yeah. uncharacteristic as political logos go. Sure. It's basically smart typesetting as opposed to like a killer high concept idea for a symbol. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. I, I think by the time that came around and remind me in the chronology, when did... Uh, when did Kamala become the running mate? Was that August or September now? I'm... I think it was August. Um, I think it was August, but I also know that I had been thinking about it since day one. Like, yeah. you know, one of the greatest things about doing a rebrand at the time that we did, March, April, May, um, was you knew it was coming so you could plan for it, even if you didn't know exactly who it was. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm really happy. One of the things that we did is we didn't try to um, be cute with people. We just... yeah tell people the truth. And um, that was at the core, such a huge tenant of what the campaign was. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, in some ways it, it made the logo easier because we knew that we weren't going to try to be cute with people. We weren't going to try to make them- It wasn't, wasn't that easy. You're forgetting. <laughs> You're blocking Yeah, yeah good point. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't- there was the 300 logos that we did yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so i mean yeah. that the, the parts of that I, I remember are you know the the the, the logo growing out of the typography so we've established yeah. the voice of the messaging and that's going to be the important thing and the logo is part of that instead of being separate from it okay. the not being clever in part because you know we're on a deadline but also in part because it's 2020 and donald trump's in the white house yeah. and it, both of us there were so many moments working on this together when we had the exact same idea from yeah. different perspectives. Yeah. And I remember that moment of saying like, I don't want to impress people. I don't want people yeah. to be like jazzed by how smart my logo is. This yeah. isn't this isn't about winning a design award. This is about getting the message of a candidate out here about right. changing the nation. Yeah, yeah. And so just on the topic of, you know, making it easier or harder, um, you should talk about the running mate situation because that was bananas the way this had to unfold. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, it, we're recording this in February now. So, you know, we're talking about things that happened a, a while ago, which in, in hindsight, everything's more rosy, which is why I'm able to be like, oh, it was so easy. And, and now that you're talking about it, I'm like, well, no, there was that true <laughs> intensity that, that never ended. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was um, what made it absurd is that we didn't know who the running mate was. Yeah, and yeah. we operated completely on information that the public had. And um, this is a huge credit to the comms team that we had too, because it was, there was no leaks. It was one of the tightest rollouts, I think, in American yeah. history. Um, and that was because the staff didn't even know it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so what that required from us was just like a ton of pre-planning. Um, you know, I know that I had, I think I had 43 minutes from knowing it was Harris to, the, to it going out into the public. And that was 43 minutes to like get things ready. But you know, there was a month of work prior to that where, you know, we read op-eds from the Times and we, you know, was looking at 538 and we were pushing at, you know, any viable media source to figure out who it was going to be. 
And um, I think once we made the decision that it wasn't going to be cute, that we weren't going to try to high concept, you know, the country, um, and we knew that we were going to be dealing specifically in letters, um, um, one of the, the funnest questions to answer was, okay, I, you know, I, I think that we have 11 potential names of what this could be. And I think there's like five that it really might be and three that I really believe in. Um, so you have this weighted system where you go, okay, this one name has nine letters. And I think it's like in the five, that's very possible to be. So we have to have a system for nine letters under Biden, which is five letters. And then, you know, there's another name that's four letters and that's also in the category of highly likely. So we need a system that's gonna work on four letters too with five letters. Um, and just that full system design uh, was really fun, but um, highly complicated technically to figure out, you yeah. know, the, the best way to find that rhythm. Um, and you're right, we did struggle with it. It didn't come to us exactly at the, you know, particular moment. I think we knew, we weren't going to be cute with things very early on, but even yeah. the execution of things took a while. Yeah. I do remember doing this grid of, you know, and again, none of the, none of the running mates names came from the campaign. They were all just like, yeah. maybe testing each other saying like, could it be Andy Klobuchar? Like, put it on the list. <laughs> yeah. Bass, put it on the yeah. list. Um, yeah. So we're doing all these logos. And like you were saying, there were short names and long names. And you, you can't make the same underlying piece of typography work with a four letter name and a nine letter name. So we had this grid of like all the candidates it could be, all the possible logo solutions it could be, and then the holes in between. Mm -hmm. And those moments of like, are you ready to redesign the entire website in 43 minutes if it's one kind of typography or another? Simply impossible. Yeah. So in many ways that dictated the kind of center of the entire thing you worked toward yeah. it would be extensible. So when the news came in, it could just get done. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, it was so absurd because like, you know, I remember Meta, who was running like so much of the digital um, for Biden. Meta was running all the digital stuff behind the scenes. And, she, you know, she would message me because she was on the West Coast at the time. So she would message me at 3 a.m. and be like, and do you have like the Act Blue wrapper ready to go? And maybe like a few pieces of quotes. And every time I got one piece of creative, what I, I was really getting, you know, 100 pieces of creative basically because it had to scale for 11 different names it had to flow out on, on different things um and you know for those few weeks it was like great message at 3 a.m now I'm, I'm making quote graphics for a potential yeah. candidate uh, I, I don't know who it's going to be um so it was a really isolating experience but it was also um you know one of the funnest problems to solve too yeah so talk about the gradients a little bit, because I know Studio Gradients is your new studio and is inspired yeah. by this, this project and this kind of moment in design. Yeah, yeah. Um, you had a lot to say about this and a lot of ideas for things that I think changed really quite a bit throughout the campaign in terms of hitting different kinds of tones. Yeah. So, um, you know, <laughs> the gradients are, are very interesting um, and they come out of so many different things at once. Um, uh, to me, there's a personal connection with them. There's also sort of like a mathematical connection with them too. Um, and a big thing for me was that they just evoked a strong feeling and um, they created warmth. And, um, uh, you know, having come from Beto's campaign where, you know, black and white was our color. So we didn't use gradients. It was like we were a black and white campaign. Um, you know, finding that you know, you could blend blue and red together to make it a solid purple, or you could find these like luscious sort of parts of um, um, color, like ended up just feeling very warm at a time that we were really alone. Um, and that's kind of the, the thing that I wanted to give people. Um, I was also cognizant that designers love to make fun of gradients. Like it's been a running joke for years. And um, uh, as much as they felt authentic to me, I, I knew that there were gonna be people who were gonna be like, oh, they're doing gradients. Obama 08 did gradients. Oh, gradients were a thing of the past. And um, gradients had to be like a thing that felt new. Um, so uh, I, I felt like a large part of what I was doing was trying to sort of reclaim them in a strange way. Um, and how I did that was of, of avoiding linear gradients. Um, um, linear gradients to me was just like a little bit too simple of a, a solution. I wanted to make these really luscious gradients that had movement and shape to them. Um, and and uh, I ultimately felt like that created warmth um, and it also felt contemporary. Um, and, you know, once the, once the campaign wrapped, um, you know, everybody was obviously asking what we were all going to do next. And um, 
I really just wanted to continue the work that that we had already been doing. Um, so, um, you know, I talked to Asia, Anna, and Eric, and um, they were all folks on on my team on the campaign. And um, I was kind of like, you know, what if we just continue this um, and we run a studio? And so it was like, well, what are we going to call the studio? And I was like, well, we're obviously going to call it Studio Gradients. <laughs> um, and uh, like, let the running joke happen or, or let people um be uh um excited about it or whatever but like it it can't be um it won't be inauthentic it, it will be as, yeah. as purely authentic as as we are yeah. so i want to hear more about this because you've done the most amazing thing which is to start a design studio in the middle of the tail end of a pandemic in new york city and be distributed in four places yep. um remind me where is everybody where's the team what are you guys working yeah. on uh, I'm in Manhattan. Um, Eric is in DC. Asia's in San Diego, um, and uh, Anna's in North Carolina. Um, so we're really a, a full remote studio. And um, uh, you know, I, I, I just wanted to be able to continue the work that we were doing with the talent that we had. Um, the campaign had so many special people on the campaign who, who were you know the best at their craft. Um, mm -hmm. um, if there is one thing that's great about a campaign is the ability to take people who are literally the best at what they do, um, and, and and give them the space to do that. So you know, Eric's one of the best political designers I've, I've ever met in my life, and is one of the best you know political developers I've ever met in my life, and Asia is one of the best political um, chiefs of, chief of staff and PM that I've ever met in my life. And to bring that talent together, um, uh, it just felt like the smart thing to do. And um, uh, so we're really, you know, we're really doing this. We're three weeks in now, um, which is very early in the process. Um, but, you know, even in the last week, I think we've um, uh, been able to sign a few clients and, and just continue the workflow. And um, there's this point when you start, a can start an agency or start a studio where you think to yourself, like, Fuck, I just really hope this works. <laughs> and I don't know if they have to bleep that out or whatever, but like you really have this moment where you're just like, I just hope this works. And then when you start to get pieces working, you're just like, okay, cool. Now it's now it's moving. I've proven that this thing is possible. And we can do what we want to do, which is just make great work. So um uh in some ways it's probably, you know, one of the dumber decisions I've ever made, but in other ways, um, you know. I've never really made a logical move um, for you know what other people would consider logical. Um, I sort of have to beat at my own drum. I have to like sort of see the table how I see it, and um, then you just trust the pieces that are that are there, and you, and you know that they're going to work. So um, yeah, in some ways, it's insane to start a, a design studio in the middle of a pandemic when we're all remote, and then in other ways. It feels like the most logical thing in the world to do because yeah. I just I know how talented everybody is and um, it's a, it's a real treat to be able to work with them. So I know we're getting the sign on time here. Um, I'm of course online at typography.com and you can find me on social media at Hefler Co. Where can folks find Studio Gradients in your work? Studiogradients.com um, uh, and Robin Canner all over the internet. Uh, come say hi. Awesome. Cool. <laughs>